So, speaking right now is Jay Beal. So let's give him a really big DEF CON welcome. So, Mike. Mike? Oh, there we go. Okay, great. So, uh, hello everybody. You're having a fun DEF CON. Uh, not been owned quite too many times yet, I hope. Who's been owned at DEF CON? Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No one's going to admit it. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, that's a better question. The, 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 the suggestion was, I've got to rephrase that question. Okay, so being at DEF CON, who here has owned someone? Okay, that's a much better. So the people who, are, the people who haven't been owned, clearly, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm maybe a little bit of fooling ourselves. So the, uh, okay, so I'm here, to, I'm here to talk about, oh, I'm here to talk about how you should make sure that both displays are uh, working. And, yeah, it's a Mac. You know, this actually somehow is better when I did it with Linux, which is really wrong. Or really right. Okay, the. You know what? Maybe we'll just start. Uh, maybe we'll just do try and do this the old-fashioned way. If there is one. View slideshow, and we're mirrored, and somehow. Okay, that works. Yeah, we're flipping. Okay, cool. So, uh, so here we are. Um, what I want to do, what I want to talk to you about today is basically man in the middle attacks. I want to talk to you about a, a tool that we've been working on, but I want to also just try to, there's a, there's a reason that we created the tool, and that was um, that we felt, uh, and we still feel, that man in the middle attacks aren't really taken, that we don't really take man in the middle attacks very seriously. And I'm hoping that uh, over time we're going to change some of that um, or that we'll be proven wrong, that maybe we do take man in the middle attacks more seriously. Uh, so the, uh, I want to, so basically the, there's a, to give you a bit of history, um, one of the things that I've, every now and then, like all of us, um, I, you know, get off on a rant, uh, right? We, you know, you start getting really upset about something and you say, okay, I've got to, I'm clearly, I'm clearly in the minority here, I've got to, I've got to, find a way to show everybody that this, that this particular security kind of thing is dangerous. And I think we've all, I think we've all found ourselves in that spot. Um, I, for me, the rants actually come out in a variety of ways. One of the ways they come out, uh, as, in, as with many, many, many open source people, is with code. Um, because you start saying, this is really annoying, I want to fix it. Or you start saying, this is really, really annoying, I want to do this. And so I started getting, uh, I started a uh, uh, getting a whole lot of ideas. I started getting a whole lot of ideas and saying, why hasn't someone, why do I only see these kinds of, why do I only see man-in-the-middle attacks really actually demonstrated the main dangerous in malware? Why don't I see them in, you know, why don't I see them in any of this, in any tools that security people use, and most of all, the security people use to, well, convince our peers and convince ourselves that a given kind of attack is dangerous. So, um, so as I started thinking about that, I started saying, okay, what I've got to do is I've got to build a tool. I've got to build a tool that makes this stuff really, really brain dead easy. If I can make it brain dead easy, it'll be really, really obvious what the danger is. We've all seen that time and time again. You go and you say, uh, we've got to patch. And someone says, yeah, patching seems important. And you say, no, 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 we really have to patch. Yeah, but we have all these other, we have all these other things we've got to do with this company or this university or whatever. We'll get to patching, but right now what we've got to do is take inventory. Um, I had that conversation way too long ago, 10 years ago, where, I was, where I, was a, I was a system administrator at the time, and I was trying to convince my boss that what we needed to do was actually take security really seriously. We had to, do, we had to like, lock down systems and stuff. And uh, we had to patch systems, and we had, to, we had to go and take these sun boxes we were running that had 60, 80 ports open and weren't using almost all of them. And, you know, I don't know, shut some of that down. And, um, and he disagreed and said we should take inventory. And uh, we should get better and better asset control or something like that. And that seemed really lame. Uh, and I switched jobs and wrote an open source tool. Um, but the, um, but so this is, in this case, um, I've had those, you know, we've all had those kind of conversations. Um, this kind of, this for me uh, came out in, okay, I got to make, 
I, the last time around, I had to make locking down a system brain dead easy. Now I've got to switch around and make um, figuring out um, figuring out how to do man in the middle attacks that would normally take some expertise um, a whole lot easier. So, so this is so this is what I so this is what I set out to design and build with the Midler. Um, and the focus was I want to make a man in the middle tool. I want to make one that's easy. I want to make one that takes that makes it so that only one person. Um, only one person or only a small number of people actually have to understand the application really well or have to understand the protocol really well, and the rest of us can just click the button, right? How many of us, how many in here, how many of the people in here have kind of had that patching conversation and made it, and finally actually won the argument and made it click for somebody by saying, oh yeah, fine, I'm going to download Metasploit right now on your computer, and I'm going to own that, and I'm going to own that system over there. And if you want, I'll own all of those over there. Um, and it's, I'm going to show you how brain dead easy it is and how any kid on the internet, you know, any kid, anybody um, can do it, how I can teach my grandmother to pwn systems. Um, okay, I've got some friends who have. Um, so the uh, anyway, so this is so this is this is. I think there's a tremendous amount of um, there's a tremendous amount of of worth in building tools that make things easy that were doable before, so that you can actually demonstrate the ease, so you can demonstrate that the attack is real. Um, there are, and we've all had that. We've all had that conversation. We've had that conversation with other very security aware people, where you're having an argument about which attack is more likely. About you know, it's like okay, well, yes, we could do this, or we could we could protect against this, protect against this. We can only do one of them right now. Which one do we go after first? And the conversations, the conversation. Mm. Um, the conversation uh, is is very often it's kind of you, in the end you know you don't really have an agreement and sometimes you have an agreement and very often that way is by saying okay boom see oh okay wow I, I really should put a lock on that door or whatever so the um, so anyway so so the the focus in building the middler middler is um, the the focus is to make a man in the middle tool that makes things easier. Um, the very first thing that I started looking at was HTTP, and I started looking at HTTP as I'll as I'll explain a little bit um, because it turns out I, I got little snitch on my Mac and uh, and this little snitch is this little program that shows you every single outgoing connection. We've all we all saw this on Windows like ten years ago, but um, but the Mac's got to do everything new. Um, it making the old new again. And uh, and so I'm lo I'm watching Little Snitch pop up and say, hey, this program's doing this, this program's doing this, and you're sitting there like, that's all over HTTP? Are you kidding me? And none of it encrypted. Okay. And so I started and so I started really getting a, a bee in my bonnet and saying, listen, HTTP is enough to target. That's that's more than enough. I mean, outside of web apps, there's you can go after so much. So, but web apps have been web apps have been really really interesting. And and for me, I think that there's still part of what I think. I, my first thought about man in the middle attacks was that we don't talk about them a lot. We don't consider them. We don't consider them, or I believe that we didn't consider them all that dangerous because it's old news. You know, we've had we've had the simplest man in the middle tool, man in the middle tools for you know for 10, 15 years. It's it's really it's like okay, well that's old. But the stuff that's old, if it's not fixed, it's still dangerous. It just we kind of stop thinking about it because there's something new and shiny and, and more dangerous now. Um, so the so what I started thinking about here was, what can I do with man in the middle that we don't think about? And the biggest thing for me um, was integrity, was, in, was attacks on integrity. I can change what the user sees. I'm not just going to write every single time somebody says clear text protocol to you. Every time I hear anybody talk about the danger of a clear text protocol, everyone says, oh my god, they'd be able to see such and such. And we say, oh gosh, but we're always talking about confidentiality. And I think that there's actually more to it. I think that there's, I think there's integrity. I think integrity attacks are a lot, lot more dangerous. So I'll, I'll try to show you a little bit. So the, um, so anyway, the biggest, one of the biggest focuses for the Midler, outside of ease of use, was trying to make it so that eventually we could build plugins, we could build, we could build attacks on web applications that were specific to the web application, so that we could put the intelligence in the tool and not force the user to have it. And, wow, not force the user to have intelligence. That's really mean. Um, not force the user to have very, very domain-specific knowledge to the application. Um, and 
part of the value to that is that we stop saying, hey, look, I can read your email too. Part of, it, part of the, the value is we say, okay, I can do a lot. And if you automate it, you can make it really fast, and you can do a lot more damage a lot more quickly. But then what else can you do? If you could, and it'd be hard as hell to keep up with this in real time as a human, but if you could do it with, if you could do it with a tool, you can start saying, wait, why don't I take any man in the middle pro- any clear text protocol that I'm man in the middling and start modifying it, and modifying it in specific ways. Why don't I make those modifications so, in essence, I'm trying to change the, I'm trying to change the victim's reality. I'm trying to change their perception of reality. I want to to, to use an extremely old movie, and I apologize for that. I want to stick them in the matrix, and I want them not to know that they're in the matrix. I want them to walk around and say, "Hey, uh, you know, that everything's. Why is there? Why did I just see the same cat? Ah, oh, it's deja vu. No, no worries. I want them to have that deja vu experience. I want them to say, "I saw something weird, but whatever. It, I, I trust what I see in front of my eyes." Um, so as an example, um, one, of the things I, 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 one of the things I thought of immediately was if I've got a whole bunch of web-based email that only encrypts the password, um, but all the, everyone using this web-based email is, is, seeing, um, is reading their email and writing their email, and, it's, and, uh, and that whole thing's clear text, why don't I start pulling emails out? They don't exist. You don't see them. They're still there, maybe. Maybe they're not. But let's pull them out. You never, see them. You never saw that they were there. Let's put some in. Um, the one of the easiest examples is you know let's let's make sure that you know let's make sure my victim never sees any emails from his girlfriend, um, and maybe we can make that right after we send him a fake email from his girlfriend that says that she never wants to see him again. She's getting a restraining order and all that. Um, you know we can start we can start changing what he thinks is going on with his girlfriend, right? And and here's the next step. So what does he do then? Well, he picks up his phone and he calls her, right? But but that's where I'm trying to go with VoIP. Um, well, maybe she's not going to get his call. So, uh, so we'll talk about it. Um, okay. So again, confidentiality. Everyone, I swear, I'm, I've, I've been a, I've been a uh, uh, what do we call it? A consultant. I've been a consultant for many years, which means that on the, you know, on the positive side, it means you get to see lots and lots and lots of different environments. You get to go into all kinds of different companies and organizations and see how different they are and how the same they are. And, and there's actually, they're actually a lot more different, I think, than, they, than anybody thinks they are. Um, but it's, you start to see, like, everyone thinks that everyone else is doing it better or doing it Maybe they think it's doing it worse, but usually they think everyone else is doing it better. It's like, no, no, it doesn't matter. Uh, the companies that are 10 times, 100 times your size or, you know, that have a whole lot more people helping them and so on are still basically doing things badly often. Um, so the, um, but the thing that I've had in so many conversations with the client, one of the things I started doing, you know, early on was saying, well, what, what do you think the risks are? What are you afraid of? You know, what do you, you know, you're, telling, you're telling us that you want us to evaluate this application or this thing or this um, or what you're doing. Um, tell me what the biggest, you know, before I go and tell you I can pwn that box over there, tell me what, you know, what is it that, what is it that actually would have, would have you have to go to your boss and your boss go to your boss's boss and so on. What would be the thing that would say, oh, my God. And I'll try to, seems like most of all, if I'm trying to figure out where your risks are and, and how real they are and what vulnerabilities exist, I should be framing it in terms of what the, uh, w- which ones could do the most damage to you. And you know what damage is. Because me pwning that one box over there, not so, not so dangerous. Me being able to modify that database over there, but not being able to own the box, far, far more dangerous if the right stuff's in the database. Okay, um, so the big thing for me is every time I talk to them, they say, they keep saying confidentiality. They don't say confidentiality. They say, well, if somebody could get that information, they could do this. They could get that information. And for me, it's like, screw, get that information, change that information. And more to the point, change it without you knowing it was changed. That's the, that's the if I think of, if I think of the, the dangers, those are the fun ones. Um, as, a, as, an example of, as an example of the confidentiality integrity thing, Okay, Twitter, right? You know, we're all many, many. Who's 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 tweeting clear text? Who's tweeting with encryption? Who's not tweeting? Oh my God! <laughs> I thought I was the only one not tweeting most days, and it turns out that okay, so this room does not use Twitter. Um, I've got a sniffer up, so if anybody with a laptop wants to, okay. So the. Um, So anyway, okay, well, I won't tell you what Twitter is. I'm going to hope that you've got that part already, despite your complete lack of experience with it. Um, But people are are tweeting. What a dumb word. I love, I think Twitter's awesome, but what's that? Oh, 
I'm not saying that. <laughs> You're supposed to always repeat the question or the comment. I'm not repeating that one. <laughs> uh, yep, 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 yep. So, so, yeah, I think you should totally, I think we should be Twitting, maybe. Uh, that's about as close as it should be. Maybe we should be Twittering, but not tweeting. Okay, so anyway, we've got Twitter, we've got tweeting. Um, if, if I were to throw up a message through Twitter, I believe, in almost all cases, it's almost always public. It's almost always public. There's a, there's a little bit of direct messaging, but it's basically public. So, so if I tell somebody, hey, oh my god, you're, you're going clear text to Twitter, they say, what do I care? I'm putting something public out there. What do I care if somebody sees it? And my thought is, well, what if you could change it? I don't know if anybody got any of my tweets uh, in the last couple days that I didn't think were going to everybody, but they were. Uh, but, but, uh, but it was really kind of you know, embarrassing and, and all that. Well, what if they'd said things even more embarrassing than whatever I managed to say, right? What if they, you know, it's, it's, that's the, uh, I, I think it would be really, really, really interesting if they said all kinds of things, uh, if, if my tweets said all kinds of things that I didn't know they said. And, uh, and heck, if you could man in the middle me for long enough in enough places, I would never know. I, my, it, would fall off my, it, would, it would fall off my radar of things that I'd said. It was just, uh, every time I pull up my iPhone, no, I don't have an iPhone, don't SMS me. Um, every time I pull up my iPhone uh, and I look at, you know, and I look at Twitter, I see it says 100 more messages. And you're like, it's only been five minutes, man. What the heck? Um, so this stuff's off the screen. What if, I can, what if people can send emails of me? Everything, think about everything you can do with every clear text protocol you can think of, not just the two I'm talking about today, that would totally, um, that would start screwing your victims, start screwing your, your victims' entire perception of what's been going on in their life. And I know that sounds really strange, but the Internet's basically a communications me medium. Um, the sites, the apps that we're most excited about, the last one with MobileMe, um, the apps we're most excited about are things that are serving as communications. If somebody can alter your communications, it starts changing, at least for a little while, the nature of your relationships. So um, let, me, let me go slightly further. I'll speak to this point just really, really briefly, and, uh, and then I'll, I'll come back to it at the end. Um, one of the first things that one of the first things I had a conversation with one of my friends and, and I said, you know, clear text, it's it's awful. And he said, Yeah, but don't we know this already? I mean I know clear text is bad. And I said, Okay, you do, fine. Um, but you told me you use Vonage. You're and he said, Yeah, I said, Well then, you know, you're you're signaling your voice, it's all clear text, I can change all your calls. It was like, Yeah, but but it's like 10 bucks cheaper a month than the normal phone company, and I really like it. And I say, that's okay, but you're also using, you're also using you know, pick your, pick your social networking site and so on. And he says, well, but I like those. They're really nice. It's like, okay, but you're a security person. And I think that's my, that's, that's my challenge to us. If, we, if we're the security people and we know clear text is bad, we know, that we, know that, we have, that we have these risks in clear text, then why are we still using it all? I mean, we're not, we can't, I guess what I'm saying is if we think it's dangerous, then why can't we convince ourselves? Much less each other. Okay. So the... Um, that's a good, uh, so let me ask, how many people are using Vonage or another VoIP provider? Everyone thinks they're going to be targeted so they don't raise their hand. We got like 10. Okay, who's using a social networking site of any kind? Okay, see, that's, that's more like it. Okay, cool. So that gets us, anyway, so we're security people. I will, um, some of this has finally started to hit the mainstream press, but I think that it's. I think that what's what's great. I think that what's great if you're an attacker right now, in terms of man in the middle attacks, is that while it's while it's while we all think it's obvious, um, our 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 non geek friends, at least our non security friends, and probably our non you know and and absolutely our non geek friends, our family members have no idea. My grandmother just knows that you know her new that her new Vonage thing is like it's a weird little box and and her phone's cheaper now she can call all kinds of people for like next to nothing and it's great but she doesn't definitely doesn't know that you know we can do anything to it she doesn't she didn't know our, our main the, the mainstream public knows virtually nothing about this i mean this was this is a news story from a couple weeks ago and it's new it's this is new. This is not a. This is not a. Yeah, it's old news. No, no, no. This is the news is getting really, really excited. Oh my God! You could be on vacation, and people could be getting your credit card numbers, and and what else? The what else is what I keep thinking about. I I, I hate hearing about credit card numbers because I'm not really that worried about my credit card numbers. You know, I I I'm at DefCon, or else I would say, dude, I'll 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 go post my credit card number on a wall. Have fun. I think I have to pay fifty bucks. No, wait, that's waived. So I have virtually no risk except that my credit card turns useless for a little while until the people are done investigating the fraud or what have you. But, 
but I'm not as worried about my credit card number. Maybe I should be. But I'm a lot more worried about, well, I'm a lot more worried about my email now. Um, uh, I'm a lot more worried about a lot of these things. So, okay, so what are we doing with Midler? With the Midler, we're working on a, bu we're, we're working on a, a bunch of great new features. Um, there are, um, I'm gonna wa I'll walk through some of them, I'll walk some of them through some of them right now. Um, there are, so the, the first one, the big one, the one, that, the one that's been uh, driving us nuts a little bit, um, has, been, uh, has been basically to say, let's pick on, let's pick on voice over IP. Because there's more and more, more and more voice over IP and Oh my gosh, it's the phone. I love the idea of being able to screw with the phone. I never could screw with the phone before. I was never a freaker. How many of you were freakers? Dude, statute of limitations is over by now. Come on, raise your hand. You were freakers back in the day. Okay, you're all too young. I'm old. I could have been a freaker, but I, I didn't. Okay, so anyway, but I never had those cool phone hacking skills, and now I can have them, and that's really, that's really cool. Um, the... Um, so voice over IP, um, voice over IP is really really fun, and I'll show you why I took an interest in it. We've also been working on a bunch of on a bunch of other things, and um, and uh, so you can and you can I'll show you some of these, and you can see the state of the rest of them in our in our Google Code Subversion. Um, uh, so the uh, I'll, one of them is we've been working on basically on a on a GUI, which means I've had to find out how many people don't how many people are in security or no protocols and have never done any GUI coding before. Um, it is really hard in an open source project to find somebody else to help you with your GUI. So I've been doing that part myself. Um, the um, we've been we decided to actually start making some of the Midler's HTTP functionality more interactive. Um, the original design on the Midler was actually to make it totally non-interactive. And that wasn't a, a lack of a feature for us. That was to make this kind of thing really dangerous. Um, to make it really dangerous, we can man in the middle all your web, all your all of your web. Then the really really fun thing would be if you could. Uh, hopefully, no law enforcement's hanging out in the room. There's nobody in here who's fed or anything, right? No. Okay. Good. Perfect. So so you know, I mean, if you were to take if you were to take a tool like this and go and put it on, you know, those WRT 54Gs and all the other little things that are like you know 30 bucks now, and you can pick them up for 30 bucks, and you can put Linux on them if they don't have it on already, and and then you've got a little computer you can deploy anywhere, and you can basically throw away. Well, you know, 30 bucks is something you can throw away, and if you bought them in bulk, you might start getting close to 20. Now, suppose that you take the, suppose you say, okay, well, you got a few friends, you're gonna go in on this together, and you're gonna spend, I don't know, uh, $2,000. You're gonna spend $2,000, you're gonna buy 100 of these, and you're gonna buy 100 of them, and that's probably more than you need, but go around New York City and go to the public parks, and public parks all have wireless, and, and uh, well, it's definitely not encrypted, so you could have some fun there already, but how nice would it be if you could put your own, put your own access points, or heck, don't even make them access points, just use them as clients. Use them as, as things that have uh, wireless access. You're going to throw them away. They're not going to store any data on them. And all they're going to do is they're all going to basically man in the middle. They're all going to they're all going to not only capture but modify traffic. They're going to take things. They're going to they're going to take all the data they see, and they're not going to go grab packet captures because who wants packet captures? Parse through it. Get all the juicy bits. Get all the data that's really really interesting. Take all of that and correlate it. I don't. What do you care if you got one of J sessions? Get all of J sessions everywhere it goes in New York City. I, I mean, it's you know as long as I'm going to go walking around on wireless and you know using my using my iPhone being like, oh, cool access points, and, and now I'm not draining my batteries much, and everything's running, everything's going so much faster. I'm just on a big shared network uh, using protocols and, that are basically designed for us all to stay on wired networks that were carefully protected physically. Right? Well, so you start to really have some chances to put me in the matrix. You also have some chances to get a tremendous amount of access to, well, everything I send out over the radio. And keep forgetting as a radio as I walk around the public park. So that's my, that's my uh, how do you make this more fun and dangerous and bigger. Like you have all these things logging to a database and you make that really, really fun. And then you start saying, what did I get? I didn't just get. Um, each time we see one of our, each time we see one of our own compromised and their stuff publicly posted, it's a snapshot in time. Um, it's, it's one point. Usually it's one box. What if you could get more? Um, with that said, I think it's really mean to own people, and you shouldn't do it, and you really, really shouldn't do some of the stuff that's been done to, to our friends lately. But um, so, have I compiled for MIPS? That's a good question. The short version is uh, we're in Python, so all I got to do, all I all I have to do to compile for MIPS is to have Python and MIPS and a bunch of and a bunch of dependency modules also in MIPS. But basically. Uh, um, I guess the short answer would be no, and the long answer would be uh, anybody seen Python running on a WRT 54G? Anybody? Okay. 
Yes, in the back. Okay, so I'll I'll take that. We'll I'll I'll call Guido after this and ask him if anybody's got Python on um, on that platform because it should be pretty simple. He might just take it as a challenge. Um, so anyway, so the um, let me go let me go a little bit further. So the um, uh, what else are we trying to what else are we trying to add? We've been trying to add um, both more application specific plugins and then also more generic plugins because that was um, that was when we when we were when we started making a release we said wait there's a whole bunch of stuff you could do to just every site or you could do to every site and then target it specifically which is part of where the GUI idea came from. We also made some serious performance improvements because well my code was slow. Um, and, uh, and the nice thing about an open source project is people come along and start fixing your bugs, and they even start going and optimizing your code for you, and it's really nice. Um, and uh, so the other thing is we've got a we've had we're getting some collaboration going, although this is all this is all open source, free stuff, not not a commercial software. So uh, uh, actually locking it all together and having everybody having everybody have their stuff together at the same time and all that's a little bit hard. But we're working with. Uh, Working with SoftSec, who's been working on something called Lib Poison, and I'll tell you more about that. So anyway, um, let me start with let me start just. Uh, I know I've kind of talked I've kind of talked right through some of my slides at this point, and I uh, and I'll try not to do that quite so much, but I get excited. Um, I think this stuff is fun. I think talking to you guys is fun. So this is okay. So the so anyway. Um, Adding protocols. Honestly, we only wanted to go after HTTP in the first place. Um, HTTP seemed like enough. It seemed like actually more than enough. And and if anybody, if any of you have watched the history of the code and, and more to the point of the releases that that uh, you know came later and so on, uh, you'll know that it was a bit off a little bit more. We can chew from the at the start. Um, and HTTP is really quite a bit. You can find quite a bit of stuff that's fun there. There's a whole lot of software update. Um, it's still done very, very badly and done without any kind of encryption or hashing, and you can get in the way of that, and we didn't, we didn't get to touch that problem. There's, um, but there's, uh, there's some other, there's some, there are some neat tricks. Um, I told you that we, we, we started out with saying we're just going to go after specific applications. Then we started saying, wait, we've got some nice tricks we can just put in everything. Um, the on, the, so there's something I'm going to show you that's some, just some neat JavaScript. Um, but, there's, but when we came to DEF CON last year and we went to our Q&A afterwards, um, we had a whole bunch of people who started saying, well, have you thought about doing this on? And they started naming the different kinds of clear text protocols. And some of them were scary. Some of them were like, you could you do this for Pop and IMAP. And I'm like, yeah, I, I thought of that. I just figured no one's really using unencrypted Pop and IMAP. And they said, dude, go over to the wall of sheep. Go talk to those guys. And so I talked to those guys. And I said, can you like show me everything besides just these passwords? And they're like, yeah. And they said, it, just like, oh my god. This is at a security conference. We got a whole bunch of clear text stuff we don't know is clear text. But, the, um, but there are a lot of protocols. And the ones that scared me weren't Pop and IMAP. They were when people started talking about SCADA. And I said, but, but I, I, I like my house having power and water and the, the dams not flooding and all of... I, I don't want... Everybody seen the latest Die Hard movie from, you know, a year or so ago? The, what, what do they call it? A, um, uh, a fire sale, which was just basically everything all at once. Every, every single thing you might start attacking and changing. That movie was great. That movie was great for integrity tax because there's a there's a point in the movie where someone's trying to where this guy is really trying to get Bruce Willis dead because Bruce Willis is causing him kind of quite a bit of trouble as he has in way too many way, way too many Die Hard movies that I've never seen actually. Um, into, I've only seen one Die Hard movie and uh, and Bruce Willis is such a pain in the butt, yippee ki yay, and so on and, and he, you know and he's and he's chasing down an attacker and waving a movie paycheck at him and all that I think um, and uh, and the and the guy you know goes and the, the guy get, goes and gets on a gets on his radio and and instructs a, a fighter jet that's in the area to, to target Bruce Willis's truck and um, and the fighter jet proceeds to absolutely demolish not just the truck I mean this guy takes his job very seriously but to basically destroy like bridges and overpasses and everything and it's beautiful it's awesome and it's like you're like dude it's one truck what the hell are you doing but but this I don't know anyway it's I wanted to I wanted to fly a fighter jet so badly um, right then and only then so anyway so and I said that's really really neat if you can go and if you could if you could go and start I mean it's also evil right but if you could go and start saying uh, gee this this fighter pilot thinks that he's just been given that he's just been given an actual valid instruction and you'd all be like yeah but it wouldn't work like that how the hell do you know 
How the hell do any of us know? I mean, the, the, right? Every single, every single little proprietary secret protocol. The more, the more insulated it, it is, the more specific it is to a given industry. The more specific it is to just one specific application, where some other company decided to write their own protocol from scratch, which is almost as bad as writing your own uh, writing your own crypto from scratch. Anybody designed a crypto system in here that doesn't have a degree in cryptography? Okay. Anybody in here have a degree in cryptography and did design a crypto system has had it broken by your peers? No one. Okay. Well, fine. But most of us have tried at some point. I know I did when I was 12, and, and that thing was a piece of... Oh, my God. Um, so, but, and we all have. We've all been like, ooh, XOR is really, really neat. No. Um, just don't do it. I, I, I'll teach you how. No, don't. So, um, so anyway, the, so people, said, people said you should really look at, at other protocols outside of HTTP because there are ones that are dangerous. And I said, well, I don't want to touch that SCADA stuff. I really, really don't ever want to build somebody the capability to really, really screw my whole city. Um, but uh, on the other hand, you know, VoIP seems like fun. So, so here's one of the other things. Um, anybody want a password hash or two? Because this is mine. Uh, so I'm going to have to change my password right after this presentation. I'm going to be in a race now to see whether you guys can break, uh, whether you guys can uh, crack passwords, whether you can crack uh, HTTP Digest authentication uh, as fast as I can finish a talk. Um, I'm not betting on me now. Um, so anyway, the interesting thing, one of the things that made it really, 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 really uh, obvious to target VoIP was... Look at this first line. Look at any of these lines, but you know all these lines are kind of like you know a, a, a header, a header name, and a colon and a value. Well, that's kind of kind of reminds me a little bit of HTTP. But the first line is the first line is method. It's something you want to, that that the that the one thing is asking the other thing to do. Uh, and the next line has a has a has a URI has a you know something like an HTTP blah blah blah. Except it's not. Um, if you've been used to looking at a whole, if you've looked at many 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 get slash foo you know HTTP 1.1 um, things, this is you're seeing the same thing in SIP. There's the request, okay? And here's a response. Um, oh wait, doesn't that look really really similar? If I change the word SIP there to uh, if I change the word SIP to HTTP and I you know. Well, if I change the version number, you start saying, "Oh, look, it's an HTTP." No, wait, that's not still not right because that's not a that's not the that's not the response I should see. That's not the status code I should see. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah. So I, I saw this and I said, "Oh, this is nice." I found an another little helpless unencrypted protocol to pick on, um, and uh, and I'm surprised at how much. So before you think, Jay, why are you why are you thinking about the obvious here? Look at the tools we have for VoIP right now. The big ones, uh, the, the VoIP tools that exist, um, and I'm not at all claiming to do anything new, actually. This is, I, I don't believe that anything, here is, that anything here is absolutely positively new. The point is making something, the point is to basically start thinking about it more solidly. We have tools that will go and grab all of the unencrypted RTP audio traffic and will play it for you. What's that? That's a confidentiality attack. Screw confidentiality. I, I, I like confidentiality, but you know, but go for integrity. Change it. We do have tools that'll change the voice stream. Um, so, so this is um, yeah. I spoke to this. I guess I've spoken to this earlier, but this is the hint for anybody who hadn't realized they just saw HTTP Digest. But if you captured a copy of that slide um, and you've started cracking the Digest already, I'd love it if you'd just tell me my password. Um, whoever, I, I'd say whoever gives me my Vonage password. Uh, First, at the end of this session, uh, definitely gets uh, at least one beer on me. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, it, it's just fine if you have your friends do it for you. Um, or it's probably just fine if you use that Beowulf cluster you owned. Um, I know what's a Beowulf cluster. Um, but OK, so there's um, the nice thing is, so the, my point, though, is that you can crack my password. but. That's not really the danger. I said I was going to have you. I, was, I said I was going to have a little race with you. That I was going to hope that I could finish talking and go and change my Vonage password before you could finish cracking it. Um, I wonder if I'm like somehow violating my Vonage terms of service by saying that. Um, but the, uh, but really the point is you don't have to. If you're, if you can man in the middle, if you can man in the middle my um, my Vonage session, then you can do anything you want to it. Uh, you don't need my password. Screw having my password. Just basically forward my forward my authentication along and modify the modify the request, reuse it. You know, the nice thing is it gets even worse than that. There's tons of things. Once my once my phone once my VoIP phone authenticates, most of what happens after that isn't authenticated. Okay, even the things that authenticate outbound calls that like basically you try to make an outbound call, you get a response that says, "Hey, you better authenticate." And here's a whole fresh new nonce, so you can't so you can't replay. Well, even those things. 
Well, they don't actually make you authenticate to receive a call. So if the call's coming in and it gets modified, or the call's coming in and it was never actually sent by the server, then, you know, fun. So, um, so uh, I hope that this, um, I hope this uh, text is readable. Um, these are the kinds of VoIP attacks we've been building into the Midler as plugins. Um, there's, uh, uh, at the very least, um, you start saying, okay, let's take all of the inbound calls that are coming to you, or heck, if we can get in the right place, all the inbound calls that are going to a given company. Um, for everyone who's basically said, and I've, we, I deal with a, a number of businesses, including my accountant, um, that have replaced their, where the, they've replaced for a 20 person or 40 person office, they've replaced their normal POTS phone lines with, with uh, their own little, you know, with their own little asterisk style system or what have you. They're using a, they're using a VoIP system. Um, um, tons. So, um, so take all the calls that are going inbound and send them somewhere else. You could send them to my phone. You could send them to some other company's phone. You could just take them and, and swap all the extensions. Um, you know, do whatever you want. Um, you could redirect all of the, in essence, redirect all of the inbound calls to one or several devices. Um, you can alter, this is the easiest thing in the world, you can alter the incoming caller ID. Uh, it's really, really simple that there's, I don't know if you remember that header back there, but, um, but there's, my, there's my phone number. Okay, from, colon, in quotes, caller ID string. Change it to anything you want. You change it to whatever you want, that's what I'm going to see in my phone. Um, so you get to change the caller ID. Um, you could add the, this is one of the things I like a lot, you add, you add your, uh, as the attacker, you add your VoIP phone to the simul ring list for my phone number and just race me and get on my phone get on my phone calls first. Oh, they hang up. And I'm not going to know. Somebody started calling me and they hung up. They didn't get me. Okay, I didn't reach the phone fast enough. Uh, well, you know, they'll call back if it's important. Maybe I'll look at the caller ID and I'll call them back. But, you know, cool. So, um, uh, this is, uh, you, can, you can, the hard trick is doing things like actually modifying the RTP. Um, but I'll talk more about that in another slide. And then finally, you could go and just say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remove the phone's registration. This is one that's really nice. Your phone registers to say, hey, I just want to let you know, that phone number, 301-591, blah, that's, uh, uh, I'm reporting for duty. I'm here. Uh, if you've got any calls, send them to me. Um, well, you could take that and you could just simply not forward it along. You can also, but what if there have been three or four registrations that have gone out already, or 300, it seems. Um, then you could just go and you can send a nice little message that says, hey, drop that registration. If you drop my registration, I can still, I still think I can make outbound calls. The thing is, the thing that's really, really nuts is that my inbound calls aren't getting to me and I don't even know that that's happening. I just know my phone's not ringing. Well, there's plenty of time my phone's not ringing. It's not ringing right now. Um, so this is, this is, you know, this stuff's kind of, kind of nice and fun. Um, the focus for us, um, one of the focuses for us was to basically, was, was again to start thinking, how do we do it non-interactively? How do we do it interactively? So the non-interactive version was going to go and was saying, okay, let's take, let's, let's let you choose that you want to only get that call or only get that person's calls. Alternatively, you could say, hey, I'm going to manage the whole network, but I only want calls for Jay because everyone else is fine, but I'm, I, I want Jay. Um, so, the, so I do that. If I look at um, altering the caller ID is, the really, is, is really fun to me. I told you it was the easiest out of all of those. It is amazingly simple. It is amazingly easy. And you really could basically do it with a couple of Netcat listeners. This is the one that you could actually keep up with in real time. And it's really, really fun because uh, we all trust caller ID. I see a call that's coming in. And my, my call, says, that it's, my call say, says it's coming in from Bob. And I say, I don't want to talk to Bob right now. And I just missed that call from my girlfriend to tell me that, you know, you, she didn't send any emails like that or what have you, right? So the, um, you can, so part of what we did was we, bas we basically made it so you can give the middler a list of phone numbers of, uh, caller, of caller ID strings of phone calls where it should rewrite the caller ID to something else and tell it what to switch it to. Um, we can set up, uh, we've talked about, we've talked about eavesdropping, um, but the really fun thing to me is if you can start modifying the call. Again, I keep thinking about integrity attacks. Who cares that you can hear the conversation? I agree that's really bad. But what if you can actually change it? What if you can change it so I don't know what's going on? Heck, you could just simply introduce static on my side of the line, but not on the other side of the line. Um, that's, in my mind, that's the really, really fun thing, is if, the co is if what I think happened on this phone call is not what the uh, person I was talking to thinks happened on the phone call. We've all had that happen a little bit. What if it happened 
a lot or what have happened in a, in a more destructive way. Um, I talked about unregistering, your, unregistering the phone. Um, we've, got some, we've got some other fun features that we're working on. Um, and, uh, and this is, so I'm basically that's, that's, a, that's my kind of table of contents where we are slide. Um, the GUI mode is, the GUI mode was the, the GUI mode was something I got really excited about and said, and, uh, and I ran into, uh, I ran into some, some serious bug hunting on the SIP on, uh, on the VoIP and said, okay, I'm going to put GUI down for now. Um, so I've put GUI down for now, but it's going to come back. And the cool thing for me with GUI is that you can start targeting, is that if we are going to go interactive, you can start targeting based on what's going on in the network, right? How many of you, I mean, like, I know we've all done it, but how many of you are, like, you know, probably sometime this weekend or sometime at one of these past DEFCONs or Black Hats has, uh, has gone and just, you know, a uh, man in the middle of the whole network. Every single packet on the network is going to route through you. Okay, I know these two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, okay, well, a lot more than you, a lot more of you just won't admit to it, and I understand. And I've and I've said that that if you're going to do it, I'd appreciate it if you would fully route my packets, keep the network working. You can see all of them that you want. Just get them there. And I'm I'm even giving you permission now. I think to modify them, um, at least mine. I can't give you permission for everybody else. But uh, but you know, like just just route my packets, because um, the worst thing in the world is really when your packets when you can't get to the internet. I mean, it's one thing to have the internet be this clear text dangerous wild west place. We're all used to that. But damn it, if you can't get to it, well, that's really painful. And all of a sudden, okay, well. Anyway, so uh, so, but how would you target me? If you're going to go on to the, if you're going to pop up on the DEFCON network and you see, and and you're seeing the same kind of view the Wall Sheep guys see, what do you start doing? You get information overload. It's a wonderful, beautiful thing, and you start saying, "Wow, if I could if later on, I'm going to look at all of this and I'll figure out what all of it was, but I don't have time. So right now, I'm just going to grab all the passwords," and and that's kind of lame, right? Wouldn't you rather be able to keep up with it all? Um, maybe you'd actually, so, so that's one of, so what we want to do with the Midler's GUI is basically make it so that we're giving you the vital info from each site. This is why application specific, this is why protocol specific gets more interesting. Because instead of showing you a whole freaking header, let's just show you, this phone's calling this phone. Do you want to go after that one? Or, and, and my focus is the more, the more plugins we can write, the more different things that we can do, the more protocols we can add, the more you can say, hey, look at this. This IP address, I know this IP address is this, um, is this Gmail address. I know this IP address has this phone number. I know this IP address has this. Ah, that's the one I'm going to go after. Um, so, you know, so basically let you target based on what's actually there. Let you find um, who's interesting or let you pick your friend out of a crowd. I don't know. If you've, if you've had the experience of, of uh, eavesdropping on the local network, one of the painful things at first is figuring out basically who's who. You see a whole bunch of IP addresses, you see a whole bunch of this, but you don't know who's surfing that specific porn, right? And you want to. You want to embarrass that person, but you can't because you don't even know who they are yet. And you just need a little more data, and it takes you a little while, and you get there. But wouldn't it be nice if you could get there a lot faster? Wouldn't it be nice if I could show you this is the person you should go make fun of and be like, dude, really? Um, right? I mean, it's it, midgets? I mean, I, nothing against midgets. I'm sure they're very sexy people, but, like, really? So, okay. So, uh, so anyway, that's the... So let us. So our, our our idea so far has been go after. Let let's at least at the very least we want to show you. We want to say this is their webmail identity. This is their this is their email address. This is um, uh, this is their social networking identity. This is what they're going to pop, pop an IMAP. This is what their phone number is. If you think about it, increasingly you're going to go after more. You're going to say, hey, this is. Do you want to see the? Do you want to see? Maybe you could give it a list of sites, or you could give it a white list of things you're not interested in. Show me everything else people are surfing, and now let me pick. Let me basically hone in and target and target more finely and they say that's the guy, that's the one I'm going after, that's the one I want a man in the middle and now I want a man in the middle of that specific session. Um, so the... Um so the, as I said, the point of the the point of the the point of all the point of the HTTP side, uh, most of all, has been to let you impersonate the user, not just not just see what the user's up to, but actually change what the user is up to. Maybe not in a way that he knows. Maybe not in a way that maybe not in a way that ever makes it to him um, or makes it to him anytime soon. It's really, really the the embarrassing thing for me is basically seeing the tweet that says, "I am whatever." I don't. I, just yeah, the but you know it's it's the it's basically the the embarrassing thing is is when we start making it so that uh, maybe if it's public then if it's public when we're going embarrassing then we say then we make your tweets change if it's private we're changing your emails we're changing your phone calls but I think that's the I think that's the fun so this is what we've been these are these are sites that we've been targeting um, with plugins um, 
these are kind of, the, I basically wanted to, uh, I wanted to give you a picture of what kinds of things you do to each of these. I think that there's, um, this is what, this is what we, this is what we've set out to automate with every, with every one of the web-based email portals. Um, we want to basically be able to add any one or more emails to your view of the inbox, but not actually put it in your inbox. It never actually, the, the server doesn't even know that you're being tampered with. You don't know that you're being tampered with, but you are seeing emails that don't exist. Later on, after you've deleted them, hopefully they're not there. Okay, great. Um, the um, we'd like to, as long as we're gonna, as long as it's true with you, like screw just reading your emails. Let's harvest your address book. Let's use your address book to find more targets. Let's let's start actually. Uh, if we go to the New York to the New York thing and we stop saying criminal and we start saying law enforcement, um, then maybe we say stick these things up all over the city. Look at the. Um, Take all of these. Uh, take all of these. Take of you know. If I'm man in the middle in your, or if I'm man in the middle in your, uh, your web mail, um, then I'd like to go through your address book. I take your address book. I say this person's connected to these people. That out of those people, they're connected to these people. And now I start to really, really get the kind of stuff that we're all that we read scary articles about people mining, about people and companies and um, and advertisers mining social networking sites and mining public information. Hey, that's nice. And this isn't even public, but it could be because it's broadcast by radio. So it basically is public, even though it wasn't intended to be. Which is the really, really Fun way of, really, I guess taking taking advantage of, of yeah. So the um, so so you go so you know I talked about sending people's emails um, profiling for me the other fun thing is basically take the email addresses that they that they turn out to have take those email addresses and look for them in everything else. Um, this was one of the other things that was really important um, when we were trying to when we were trying to design the API for um, for SIP. One of the things we did is we said okay let's you know. The a very very simple argument was: Do we make the uh, do we make the thing that can parse the SIP URIs only available to the SIP proxy where they'd be used in the SIP plugins? No, screw that. If I see a SIP URI in email, don't you want to be able to do something with it? Um, so the so if you start in essence, part of the goal is you start to be able to correlate information. I think there's going to be a lot of fun with databases here, and probably too much evil too. Um, the other the other big one that's kind of the the obvious thing that, that I think people don't think of enough is if you can you know we all we talk about session cloning now and then, and when we talk about session cloning, what we don't really think of is if you're actually man in the middling, um, if you're actually man in the middling a session, dude, the user clicks log out. Show him the logout page. I don't mean just show him the page. I mean send him the send him the same response the application normally sends. This is why it's nice to get specific to the application. Send him the okay. Set your you know set your cookie set your your session cookie back to an empty string or set your cookie to some you know or set your cookie to an nonsense value or whatever it does. Make him totally logged out. If his browser if he hits back on his browser he gets a login prompt. Meanwhile you continue with the application. That's that's how I that's that's where I go with it now. All that means is you've got to make sure that his logout request doesn't get there, and that you give him the right thing, the right response to it. Um, social networking sites. Um, I, I've asked. I've been surprised how many people don't use LiveJournal. Who in here uses LiveJournal? Really? Okay. So uh, I'm in Seattle. Seattle's a very odd kind of town. We've got lots of free Wi-Fi everywhere. Um, we also have a tremendous number of live journal users. Um, it's a nice little, it's a nice little app where you can kind of, you can kind of talk to your friends about your day. Kind of the the big version of Twitter. You write, you know, four paragraphs about he said, she said, and I can't believe so and so and and such and such. And the whole deal about it is, it's kind of, you know, they call it journal, but it's, but the idea is that you're kind of journaling to your friends. And so your most posts you put into it only your friends can see. And actually you can go and say, these posts are only available to some friends. These posts are about my sex life. They're only about the, they're only for, in my case, my wife, but maybe, you know, in, 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 in other people's cases, you know, this whole set of 20 people. And these posts are only for everyone who's not my coworkers. Because when I want to, when I want to complain about work, right, I want to, I want to tell all my friends, but, but not the ones I work with, right? So that's, so then people set up filters for each of those. Well, you know, screw it, violate the filters. If you're seeing all of their traffic, you can go and do things like, you can go and read their private entries, you can read the stuff that's only to their friends, you can take the stuff that was only to their friends and change it and make it public. Um, because that might be really upsetting. Um, or make it just visible to, if you want to be more subtle, you'd make the stuff that was visible only to the non-coworkers visible to coworkers and only to the only to the people who could know about their sex life to all their other friends, I guess. So um, you start doing things like this. You can, you know, some of the obvious, some of the obvious things that really kind of only the JavaScript worms have done. You go and say, hey, let's add my user. Let's add, let's add my user to your friends list. You know, why should Sammy get to have all the fun? Um, 
Okay, so the um, another feature we've been working on that I've talked about is the is the cloning arbitrary sessions. Um, we've been doing um, we've been doing we've been trying to build up a bigger library of things of JavaScript you can insert. Again, focus is make it so that make it so that to do these kinds of attacks you don't have to know the you don't have to know the protocol already or you don't have to know JavaScript you don't have to know any you don't have to be domain expert in the given area. Um, I want to kind of take us away from the browser for a second, um, but the and just take us the I talked about I've talked before about banks. Um, one of the one of the nice tricks we did. I love this. If you have a friend who does his online banking and goes to a clear text page, and that clear text page has an SSL submit form, make him stop right now. Make him stop absolutely. Show him. I I, I will send you some. If if we don't, no, we have code. Yeah, we have code. We have code in the middler that does this right now. Um, show him this. Show him. Take him to US Bank if you like, and go and type into a password form and watch. Um, what we've done is we just say it's a clear text page. Insert some JavaScript into the page. Change the on key press handler. Every single time you hit a the, the, your user hits a button, the key press is sent as a separate request, all AJAX style and everything, um, off to our server. Um, and then when you hit submit, that's that, that's encrypted. I can't see it. But what do I care? I already have it. I'm done. If the if the if the, the big lesson with HTTP, the big big lesson with HTTP is basically, if it was ever clear text at all, fail. That's just it. I, I just you've got too many you've got too many opportunities. Um, so I'm going to go right past U.S. Bank and um, yes, if you uh, if you can see the um, if you're if you're a man in the middle in my browser, if you can execute JavaScript in my browser, you can you can basically check and see what sites what sites I visited. Um, so you know, take your set again, take your set of your favorite you know, of your favorite scary porn sites and uh, and find out who's actually going to them. Um, uh, maybe take if you see a spam that comes in, uh, see if anybody's actually buying by uh, by saying, okay, well let's see if that's in their history. Um, so. The thing is, um, we wrote we wrote the middler in Python. We're writing the middler in Python, and our team has been and our and our team has been growing because uh, I remembered that I was an open sourcer um, a little while ago. Open sourcer. That's kind of like sorcerer. I like that. But I remembered I was an open sourcer, a source person uh, a, a while ago, and realized, wait a second, there's a lot of people who want to help. Um, there, and I, it's been really nice. I've been able to I've been able to get a lot of help and also a lot of bug fixing, and unfortunately not enough as all. Uh, but the uh, but what I'd like to what I'd like to do is, if you're finding this stuff interesting at all, um, consider writing a plugin. We'll teach you how. Because honestly, the big deal is that every single every single plugin requires some amount of knowledge of the application, and there's just only so many applications we can go after. Um, in the case of the web applications, in the case of VoIP attacks, I, we're only so creative. Please, uh, I, I, the biggest thing is, um, you know. Come help us develop because I think that we'll get some. We've we've already been getting some really really cool stuff out of people that have been joining on lately, and uh, I think there's a lot of I think there's a lot of opportunity to have a whole lot of fun with this. Um, so let's see. I've got a. In particular, there was something I wanted to do here. Um, I've got a. Uh, turns out I've got a bug in my code. It turns out I've got a really 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 annoying bug. In my code, um, and if I can actually flip it over, I could show you. I've got a, um, I've got a really, really annoying bug in my code. And uh, who in here codes Python? Come on. Okay, about 10, 20 people. Okay, I'm fine. I, I want to see you all outside this room right afterwards. I have homework. Um, I have homework for you. Um, so the, um, the. Where'd it go? I seem to be missing a file. Um, well, I have a problem, and my problem is this. And I've had a whole bunch of, I've had a whole bunch of friends in the last, uh, in the last 24 hours try to figure it out. But they've been doing that through uh, uh, tremendous amounts of sleep loss and alcohol because they said they were at a hacker conference or something. I'm not sure what they're talking about, but it's, uh, but basically what I've got is, um, when I, when I, uh, you know, I tell you what, I'll just tell you what I've got because getting to the, we're running short on time. And so getting to the specific spot 
Anybody wants to see it, I'd love to, and I'd be happy to show you. What we've got right now is um, a proxy should basically be bidirectional. That's kind of one of the things you'd like a lot. What we've got right now is uh, the phone. Uh, you uh, you pick up your phone, you pick up your VoIP phone, and you dial, or you get an incoming call. And here's what happens for us. Um, there are kind of there are kind of six steps, as it were. Um, step one is you know the packet goes uh, the packet goes out of the phone and it hits the proxy. Um, the proxy gets it. The proxy then takes it, it parses it out, it gives you all the good, gives you all the good information, and it can change it. That part, that part happens. It then looks at the packet and says, okay, now where should this really head? And it sends it off to where, where it should really head, which is usually some upstream SIP, some upstream, uh, SIP proxy server. So it gets up to the proxy server. The proxy server looks at it and says, oh, cool. Proxy server says, this is something I'm used to, this is valid, fine, and sends us a response. And the response comes back, and it hits our system and it gets sniffed by the sniffer, and I look at it, and it's good. And it doesn't go through. It doesn't go in. I don't know why it doesn't go in. We're doing a stateless proxy. Um, we're doing a, a, a pretty stateless proxy, which means that basically uh, handling a requ- uh, and oh, and SIP is peer-to-peer. Um, so there really aren't, uh, it's not like there are really actually clients and servers. So uh, in any given, in any given uh, request response, um, the the phone might be the might be the client, or the server might be the client. But anyway, we can't get it to go both ways, and because we can't get it to both go both ways, I didn't bring happy shiny demos here, um, and I'm really I'm really upset with it. What I brought instead was code and uh, was code and packet captures. So, either what I'll say is this: um, if I can, I have been I have been trying extremely hard to figure out how to make that one tiny problem go away for about 48 hours. Um, maybe 72. Maybe, okay, I don't know how many days, but it's been really, really nuts. Um, and uh, it's driving me nuts. And uh, I'm going to say this. If you are feeling industrious and want to look at the code and fix it, um, or at least say, <laughs> what were you thinking? Um, uh, feel free. I would love it. And you can even corner me because if I can fix this before, uh, if I can fix this before tomorrow, I am absolutely positively going to uh, going to tweet it. But I'm do more than tweet it. I'll basically make a video with I show you uh, a nice little application for the Mac that lets you do video screenshotting in essence. Except it's not screenshotting; it's video of your screen, and I'll post it, and you can all look at it because I really wish I had a demo for you. Um, and if you're the person who fixes it, obviously you just became a co-author, even if you never write another line of code, um, which is some nice credit. Uh, you write a nice, nice big tool. Um, so the, um, uh, if you want to fix it, please, we'd love, the, we'd love the help. If you don't want to fix it, well, come along after you see the demo and help us write some more. Help us write some stuff that we haven't set out to do because we haven't even thought of it. Hell, add another protocol. I'll tell you how. It's pretty simple. This is Python. It's a wonderful language for this. I wish there were, you know, kind of better debuggers for, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a wonderful language for it. Um, we'd very much love the help. If you want to, uh, if you want to corner me and look at my uh, look at my bug, I'll be happy to show you in Q and A. Um, but uh, I'm hoping that sometime today or tomorrow, I'll be uh, posting up a video that shows it working and. Uh